we're going to talk about something today, and it's so important for what we're, as a body, are about to go through. As I'm working on this sermon, I was trying to think, how can we press in? Pressing into Dad. Pressing into his kingdom. And anyone ever been thinking something and get a sharp rebuke from your father? He said, I want you to stop that right now. You're not pressing into anything. Huh? You are not separate from me. And I am not separate from you. I took you out of the kingdom of darkness and I placed you into the kingdom of my son. You are not separate. You can't press into my kingdom. The only way to get there is for me to put you there. Amen. So what are you pressing in? What do you mean by pressing in? No. You're becoming aware. And the more you become aware, the more the resources of the kingdom are available to you. I don't, want, I don't want you or anyone else thinking that you have to press into me. I'm on the inside of you. I don't want you or anyone else thinking, I've got to press into the kingdom. No. The kingdom is on the inside of you. So I think Paul was absolutely honest. I mean, we're going to read a few scriptures. So the first thing Dad wants to do, it's like a three-pronged message. He wants, to, he wants to encourage us. Then he's going to give us a word of warning and then encourage us again. And the word of warning isn't a rebuke. is isn't for something anyone has done, but it's just to be something, something to be on the lookout for as you walk further and further and further in your knowledge of the kingdom. Amen? All right. So we're going to read a few scriptures out of 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you, the testimony of God. For I determined to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is a message all in of itself. Jesus Christ, because in that message is his death. In that message is his resurrection. You can't have the crucifixion of Jesus without the resurrection. You can't. It's, it's like, hold on, where is it? It's like, that's two sides of the same coin. The fact that he was crucified is the same side, is a different side of the same coin for him being resurrected. I mean, Joe, here you go. I can't toss you just the head's side of that quarter. He's got both sides of it. He's got the death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul said, for I determined to know nothing to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why is that so important? Because it is in that crucifixion that you were crucified. You were crucified to sin. You were crucified to death. They no longer have any power or authority over you. Does that mean you'll never sin again? No. But it means it doesn't have any power over you. You were crucified to it. You were crucified to the law. Before Jesus came, you were married to the law. There's no way to get out of marriage but death. Jesus came and died for you. That's why that message is so important. Him crucified. Verse 4. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power. What is the demonstration of that power? The demonstration of the spirit and power. What is that power? That power is the Holy Spirit. And that power is not the power. Many people, in order to see the things of God, to see the things our Father has for them, need endurance. And so many people will say, you need endurance to get power. But no, he gave you power to get endurance. You can't use something temporal to get something eternal. No, he gave you something eternal to get everything temporal. 
He gave you power. He gave you the Holy Spirit to get whatever you need. And my speech and my preaching were not in the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. For our next phase, we're going to need power. Anybody catch what I said wrong there? Anybody catch what I said wrong? Are we going to need power? Anybody here? And if you don't, just tell me. Anybody here have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them? Then you have power. What we need to do is recognize it. Recognize the fact that we have the creator of the universe running around on the inside of you. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. That's verse 6. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware. Lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. Beware. You know, actually, let's, let's do the next couple of verses because they're key. Verse 9, in him dwells the fullness. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead. How? Bodily. Okay, what does that mean to me? I'm so glad you asked. If the fullness dwells in him bodily, and he dwells in you. Uh-oh. He's blaspheming. No, he ain't blaspheming. He's reading the Bible. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And he dwells in you. How about this? Ephesians 1.3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you get that Jesus Christ himself is every spiritual blessing that heaven has to offer? The fullness of the Godhead dwells in him, and he dwells in you. What can possibly stand against you? Nothing. Nothing. Let's go back to Colossians. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him. You lack absolutely nothing. Or nothing. Nothing. I don't lack nothing. <laughs> nothing, honey. So verse 11. In him you also circumcise with the circumcision made without hands. What does that mean? The circumcision of the Israelites, of the nation of Israel, was the sign of the covenant. But my heart is circumcised. What does all that mean? 2.13. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made you alive together with him, having forgiven you. All trespasses. All means all. He forgave you everything. Why? Because there's something that he needs this body to do right now that they can't do with a sin conscience. It doesn't mean that you're perfect in your behavior, but it means that you're perfect before him. You can't speak what you need to speak. You can't carry the authority and the power you need to have unless this is true. You've been forgiven all of your trespasses. All of them. Recognizing this is spiritual maturity. So often you hear that spiritual maturity are people who act a certain way. Spiritual maturity are people who realize something. And this spiritual maturity carries a weight and glory that you can't possibly understand. Hell knows it. And hell is afraid that you'll get it. No. We got it. Verse 14. Jesus 
He wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, and he took it and nailed it to his cross. Verse 18 says, Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility, the worship of angels, intruding into, into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Let no one cheat you. If anyone tells you that you have to do anything to earn what dad has freely given you, they are trying to cheat you out of something. We need to walk out what he's given us, but you can't earn what he gave us. You can't earn what you've been born into. You can't earn what our Father has given you. And anyone who tries to tell you otherwise is trying to cheat you out of something. We will not be cheated. We will not be cheated. And what he gave us is so much more than a pass to get out of hell. Amen. Pressing in. That is what I thought we were doing. But as you can see there, we're not pressing in. Fading out. We're becoming aware of who we are in him. And then becoming aware of what he has done on the inside of us. We are becoming aware. That was Father encouraging you. But here's the thing he wants. He says, I have a warning for you. Here's the warning. Anybody remember a guy named John the Baptist? You remember the first time John the Baptist met Jesus? You remember when John was baptizing people? And he saw Jesus come and go, that's the one! That's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is there any doubt in anyone's mind that John the Baptist knew who Jesus was? I mean, of course he knew because he was his cousin. But did he know who he was? He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But there came a point in John's ministry where he started to doubt that. Wow. Why? Because John... John sent, you remember he sent a couple of his disciples to ask Jesus a question. Are you the one, or do we look for another? What's up? Are you the one? Why? John knew the prophecies. And it's so amazing the way Jesus answered him. Who was Jesus? Jesus was the one that he said, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to do some things. He has anointed me what? To preach the gospel to the poor. Sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Recovery of sight to the mind. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. John was oppressed. John was not at liberty. He was a captive. So John said, wait, I'm a captive. Are you the one? What did Jesus tell him? Did Jesus say, well, Malachi said, um, I'm sorry, well, Michael said, he'd be born in Bethlehem. I was born in Bethlehem. No, he didn't say that. Did Jesus go through a litany of prophetic scriptures describing himself? No. He said, go tell John this, the things which you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. He said, John, stop looking at what I ain't doing. Look at what I am doing. Stop looking at what you don't see me doing. Look at what I'm doing. And that's the warning. Because when we get into that point, we were like, Jesus, are you the one? 
Jesus, are you the one? The problem with that is that at that point, Satan has you right where he wants you. Because it's only a small step into the worst sin that you can get into. I'm not talking about a sin of adultery. I'm not talking about a sin of, of, of murder or a sin of, of, of uh, stealing. It is the sin of unbelief. And as we press into the next phase of our lives here at Word of Grace, Dad says, watch it. So that Satan doesn't come in and lead you down into a road of unbelief. Because once we start going down that road, it affects everything. Right then, John, I wish I had some bags, is carrying a whole bunch of luggage. A whole bunch of, bunch of luggage. And it affects the way you pray. It affects what you confess. It would affect everything about you that's godly. Oh, oh Lord, I, you know, I, 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 prayed, I prayed for this once before and nothing happened. You know, I, I gave once before and nothing happened. No. Keep your faith in the word. Keep your faith in the one who, who died, rose, and ascended. Keep your faith in the one who lives on the inside of you. Amen? Amen. Because we're not going to let the devil win. And as we step into the next phase for ourselves, the phase where his spirit is manifested more and more often in our services, manifested more and more often with you, with me as I go out on my day-to-day -day activities, with you as you walk through stores and you pray for people. Don't ever think to yourself, oh, what if I pray for them and they don't get healed? No. What does the word say? Word says that those who believe in his name would lay their hands on the sick and the sick would. That's what the word says. What does unbelief say? Oh, Lord, I'm going to be embarrassed. No. Because Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Blessed is he or she who's not offended in me. Whatever the word says is what we do. Whatever it says. All right. Then how, as we enter into this next phase, how do we get there? You know, there's a, 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 a character in the Bible, a prominent one, who followed, arguably, the greatest leader of the Old Testament. His name was Joshua. And at this time, Joshua and the children of Israel were trying to move out of the desert into the promised land. And this is something that Dad told him. Your destiny is in your mouth. And you don't want to start speaking something out of doubt, out of unbelief, your destiny is in your mouth. And what did he tell Joshua? Joshua 1 8. He said, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. This book of the law will not depart from my mouth. I want to bring that into today. Because at that time, all they had was the law. But this is what we're going to say. You're going to repeat after me. The word of God, word of God will, not depart from my mouth. will not depart from my mouth. Because of that, because of that it, will it will be my meditation. Day and night. Day and night. So that I can make my own way prosperous. So that I can make my own way, so that I can make my own way successful. I didn't feel that. I, I didn't feel that. We're going to try that again. Make me feel it. Make me feel it. The word of God, the word of God will, not will not depart from my mouth. 
Because of that. It will be my meditation. Day and night. So that I can make my own way prosperous. So that I can make my own way successful. Okay, I felt that a little more. A little more. Here's the thing. What we are about to do requires us to become aware of our dad's presence. It is when we're in his presence, and it's when we try something. The next time you go out with your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever, before you go into the restaurant, before you go into the store, just spend a few moments getting in the spirit, meditating on the fact that you have the resurrected Christ living in you and resting upon you because you reflect what you are aware of. Just like someone who's depressed and angry can walk into a store and everyone can feel his depression and angry, anger. Let that place feel the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit resting on you. We have to be cognizant of it. Amen? Amen. That's your job. He came inside of you for your benefit, but he rests on you for the benefit of everyone you come in contact with. Amen? The children of Israel were about to go out of the desert into the promised land. This is in Joshua 3. But in order to do that, everybody know what the Ark of the Covenant was? He says, I want you to follow the Ark of the Covenant. So the priests had it on their shoulders. And you're following it several thousand cubits. Why? Because at that point in time, there's a separation between the father and his children. But thank God for the blood of Christ. There's no separation. 2,000 cubits. They, he's like, I want you to be about a half mile behind the ark. That's a long way. He did. That's why the rebuke about not pressing in. You're not external. He is not external to you. This is not some theology course where you're studying about him. No. You're falling in love with him. And the key to what is next for Word of Grace, they were following, the ark represents the presence. For us to get to the next phase, as I said, July 1st, I believe it is, is the midway point for 2016. And for us to cross over into what he said is our inheritance. What is our inheritance? Manifestation, restoration, growth, and closeness. That's your inheritance. As a matter of fact, anything that he tells you to do, be strong. And of a good courage. At that point, strength becomes your inheritance. Anything that he tells you to do becomes your inheritance. Because no word of God comes to you without the ability to bring its own self to pass. And when he gives it to you, it's yours. It's your inheritance. Mm-mm-mm. And this is something else I want everyone to know. This book of the law, the word of God shall not depart from your mouth. A lot of breakthroughs in your lives, a lot of breakthroughs in the lives of your family, a lot of breakthroughs in your career, in your job, are one decree away. One decree away. And I don't mean a mealy mouth decree. Who do you have on the inside of you? The spirit of the resurrected Christ. That means so often the Pharisees, oh God, he speaks with such authority. That's how you should speak. When you're praying for your wife, when you're praying for your husband, when you're praying for your daughter, your son, when you're praying for your boyfriend or girlfriend, when you're praying for your job, 
These aren't prayers of request. You're not requesting the devil to stop. How many times did you ever see Jesus, oh, would you please leave him alone? No, he said, shut up and come out of him. Don't go back into him. And you know what? The devil listened, and he had no choice. And every time you speak, every time you speak, hell trembles, and he says, it's the same voice. It's the same voice. What voice is that? The voice that said, I curse you to your belly. The same voice that said, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. Whenever you speak, whenever you command, whenever you use dad's word against the devil, he's like, it's the same voice. He can't tell the difference. Speak it like it. Do it in public. Why? Because your father is on the inside of you and he's backing up every word. So when you speak to cancer, when you speak to depression, when you speak to divorce, when you speak to bill, when you speak to bills, when you speak to anything that your father didn't see, speak to it. Command it to shut up and get out. Why? Why is that so important? Because creation is groaning, waiting for you to get it. Creation is groaning, waiting for us to get it. It's a shame that most Christians never truly understand the power that's on the inside of them. Why? Because we get these preachings, oh, you're just a sinner saved by grace. No, you were a sinner. You have been saved by grace. Now, you're a child. Speak like it. Act like it. Yes, I know you messed up. I, yeah, you got drunk. You did this. You did that. It doesn't matter. When one of them little British princes messes up, it doesn't take their position out of the kingdom. He could be drunk with every lady of the evening in Las Vegas. He's still the prince. You can mess up in every way possible. You can't mess up more than the blood of Jesus yes. is able to fix it. Yes. It is not a license to sin. It is a license to act like who you are. Yes. Don't ever let it go. Don't ever let it go. I am so, ah, I just want to punch the devil right in the mouth. Because I see my brothers and sisters oppressed by him. And it shouldn't be that way. One Jesus walking the earth shook up the world. We got millions of Christians. We have 110 or so on the rolls of Word of Grace. 110 Jesus is running around. We should be changing the world. And we're trying to reproduce ourselves over and over and over again until Northern Virginia is filled with a whole bunch of little Jesuses. That's your job. That's how your father reproduces. He put the seed on the inside of you and you reproduce it in someone else. Amen?